Okay, mutualisms. Everybody knows about these. These are fun to talk about. Um, I have here highlighting the anemone fish, the, sorry, clownfish and the anemone, which have a mutualistic relationship. Well, what is a, a mutualism? We're going to go over that today. So we're going to start with just a little introduction, talk about plant mutualisms, including mycorrhizae and ants, coral mutualisms, and why or how uh, mutualisms evolve. So some other common mutualisms that are often cited are lichens, which is a mutualistic uh, relationship between cyanobacteria and fungi. And you have the mutualistic uh, relationship between pollinators, such as bees, um, flying insects, and uh, flowering plants. So mutualism is an interaction between different species in which both partners benefit. There's a positive association for both. And mentioned in class, you could have a facultative mutualism where it's not necessary, it's convenient, um, but and there is benefit to both, but it's not necessary for their continual survival. An obligate mutualism, on the other, other hand, is where they have to have the other, other one in order to survive. Um, it has a direct relationship with their fitness. Margulis and Fester um, also put together um, evidence that eukaryotes, the origin of eukaryotes, occurred through a um, mutualistic relationship between a small prokaryote and a larger prokaryote. Okay, and so that's called the endosymbiosis theory. Alright, so some plant mutualisms. Um, very common cited mutualism is the relationship between a fungus and a plant called mycorrhizae. There's two different types. Our buscular mycorrhizae, mycorrhizae, they actually inhabit the insides of cells, so they infiltrate the inside of the cells, and then the hyphae, or the fungal part of the filamentous part of the fungi, um, interacts with vesicles within the cells um, to provide nutrients for them and also get nutrients from the plant. Ectomycorrhizae, on the other hand, would be this side, and these are more external. Um, they do have some internal infiltration, but most of it is just external. All right, so Alan, Alan studied the relationship between um, grass agropyron and the mycorrhizae within it. Uh, the plants with the mycorrhizae maintained higher leaf water potential, so they had more access to water. Um, plants with greater access to phosphorus, so this was also being provided by the mycorrhizae, developed roots were more efficient at extracting and conducting water. Hardy, another scientist, suggested that mycorrhizal fungi improve water relations by providing more extensive contact, so it's really just an extension of the roots with moisture in the rooting zone and providing extra area for water absorption. So both, both gave evidence for increasing water absorption, one due to the effect of phosphorus and increasing the ability of the plant to absorb water, and the other just the extension of the roots. All right, so Johnson investigated whether fertilizer can help select for mutualistic mycorrhizal fungi. What he did was he took a fungal partner, um, a mycorrhizal fungi partner, and received an equal quantity of photosynthetic product in trade for low quantity of nutrients. So in nutrient poor environments, plants invest disproportionately in roots and you found higher root investment in low nitrogen soils. So this is the setup that he had. He had unfertilized soil and fertilized soil, so this has more nitrogen in it. He sterilized um, and he mixed the soils. He sterilized so he would kill all the mycorrhizal in one and sterilized the other, and so there were no mycorrhizae in this pot. Here he sterilized the unfertile and left the fertilized soil intact, so mycorrhizal from the fertilized soil. And then this one has, oh sorry, this one has mycorrhizal from the unfertilized, sorry, mycorrhizae from the fertilized soil. This one has mycorrhizae from the unfertilized soil, but not from the other. And his results suggested that mycorrhizal fungi from unfertilized soils supplied plants with more nutrients. Okay, plants, basically the plants with the fertilized soils didn't need mycorrhizal because it had all the nutrients it needed. 
but the mycorrhizae in the unfertilized soil provided the nutrients it needed. Andropogon produced inflorescence only in nitrogen supplemented treatments. So herbivores attempting to forage on acacia plants will be met by a couple of um, unwieldy visitors, including thorns and acacia ants. Okay, they're very agile and highly aggressive, so they keep things off the acacia plants. The thorns provide a living space for the ants as well. And then there are nectaries provided by the acacia plants for the ants. Um, so what they found when they looked at both of them is that without ants, acacia height increased dramatically. Sorry, with ants, it increased dramatically. Without ants, there was a big difference. So Janza demonstrated ants significantly improved plant performance. So it, that graph we showed you before. Um, they also had more suckers from growing from acacia stumps um, with ants on them. And that lengthened um, at seven times rate of suckers without ants. Okay, so the suckers with ants survived at twice the rate of suckers without ants. So again, if you've got ants, the suckers are the parts of the plant um, which helped the plant grow increase as well. A coral mutualism is between a zooxanthellae, which is <coughs> these uh, cyanobacterium, and uh, the corals, which are a um, cnidarian, so similar to a jellyfish, but they attach to a certain area. The zooxanthellae live within the tissues, and they provide um, organic compounds, so sugars, um, and they receive nutrients from the coral. They have signal compounds from the coral, from the polyps, which um, affect the permeability of the zooxanthella and make them release their compounds. Corals also control the rate of the population growth and density by influencing how much is secreted of the organic matter or the sugars. The main zooxanthellae benefit appears to be access to the nutri higher nutrient levels, especially nitrogen and phosphorus. And so the ammonia excreted by the, um, by the coral is absorbed by the zooxanthellae, or zooxanthellae. There's another mutualism found with corals with um, crustacean mutualists, and these are generally these shrimps, um, which help to kind of protect the, um, the corals. And the crustaceans, you can see in this graph, were attacked much less frequently when they had these shrimps here to protect them. So there's a mutualistic um, relationship there. So they would fend off sea stars essentially. Um, also, crabs did a similar thing. They promoted coral health and integrity. Um, the release of fat bodies um, by the corals um, increased the ability of the crabs to grow, and then the crabs would also protect them from starfish and other things. So within the uh, digestive system of these crabs, you found products of coral um, products. All right, so why did, how, why and how did um, mutualisms evolve? Well, you have to have a benefit from both, which exceeds the cost of being without. So Keeler developed models to represent relative costs and benefits of several types of interactions. So successful mutualists give and receive benefits. Unsuccessful mutualists give but do not receive benefit. So here bo both the alligator and the bird are benefiting. Um, the bird gets a free meal, the alligator gets um, parasites cleaned off of him. So this would be successful. Here you have remoras which are fish hitching a ride on this um, large sea turtle. Well, if the sea turtle's not getting a benefit, which these guys don't really do anything for the sea turtle, then it's not going to be a successful mutualistic relationship. A non-mutualistic relationship neither gives nor receives benefits. 
So for a population to be mutualistic, fitness, the, the ability to survive and reproduce, has to be greater than un unsuccessful or non-mutualist. If not, natural selection will eventually eliminate the interaction. Okay, so if they're not increasing, then they will decrease.